Let's open with a primitive prayer. As we still our minds and open our hearts, we turn to a place of peace deep within. This morning, we welcome spring, life's renewal. We affirm not only our connection to one another, but to a vibrant force of life that comes awake about now for everyone to see. We know that same life force moves through and as each of us here now. Spring is a time of renewal and I am a willing participant. I renew myself by opening to joy. I allow the signs of new life, colors, sounds, beauty to fill me with joy and life flows a little stronger through me. I renew myself through giving and receiving love. I watch for and acknowledge the goodness in others, and life grows a little stronger through me. I renew myself through service to others and by allowing others to serve me, and life flows a little stronger through me. I renew myself by moving my body and through quiet and rest and life grows a little stronger through me. I renew myself through gratitude. I acknowledge all I am and all that I might become. I feel into my abundance, and life flows a little stronger through me. Today, I hear spring's promise. Life, moving forever beneath the surface of things, waits ready to expand through each of us as we extend ourselves in joy, love, service, and gratitude, enlarging life itself. And so it is. It's the moment of creation. It's an everlasting peace. It's the freedom of the gifts. It's the sweetness of release. It's the joy of inspiration. It's the sunlight on your face. It's the birthright of all nations. It's the boundlessness of space. It's the beauty of the baby. One power. 
power, one power, one power. Leave the familiar for a while. Let your senses and body stretch out like a welcome season onto the meadows and the shores and the hills. Open up to the roof. Make a new watermark on your excitement and your love. Like a blooming night flower, bestow your vital fragrance of happiness and giving upon our intimate assembly. Change rooms in your mind for a day. All the hemispheres in existence lie beside an equator in your heart. Greet yourself in your thousand other forms as you mount the hidden tide and travel back home. All the hemispheres in heaven are sitting around a fire chatting while stitching themselves together into the great circle inside of you. I am a child of the living God made in the image of perfect love. everybody and happy Easter a little bit early we have our own little Easter bunnies up here on the stage with us so um, a couple of quick announcements um, I want to remind you next Sunday is actually Easter we will be ho hosting our annual Easter egg hunt next weekend all children are welcome so if you have family or friends or grandchildren please feel free to um, invite them to come and join us we will have plenty of treats available for everybody Today, following the service, we're going to have an early Easter celebration. One of our um, high school graduates, Nicole Gallagher, she has been a member of 4-H uh, for a long time, and she has a lot of pet rabbits. So she is going to bring in some of her pet rabbits in their cages out on the porch after, after church. And the kids and anybody else who would like to pet the rabbits is welcome to do so. However, if you would like to pet the rabbits, please wash your hands first before petting them. You can wash them after as well, but um, we have a, a request to protect the health of the rabbits this year by us washing our hands. And um, one final comment. Last weekend, John Previty and I uh, were part of a group of 10 adults who were planning our Unitreat um, camping experience for the summer. That's the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. So there were 10 of us that spent two and a half days planning a week-long retreat for the middle schoolers this summer, and John had been to the planning before. It was my first time attending, and it was very inspiring, and the middle schoolers have some super fun coming up this summer, so we're excited for that. Thank you. Thank you for being our family. Thank you for being our friend. Thank you for blessing and teaching us. God bless you. Amen. All that I am all I've been given to you, my God, I surrender. Thank you, Michelle, and your crew. And I have another one up here very excited that there are bunnies today. Welcome and good morning to Unity in Linwood, to each and every one of you, whether you're here with us in person or you're taking advantage of our new option of live streaming. We're just happy that you've chosen to be with Unity in Linwood on this Sunday morning. 
Well, it's official. Today is the first Sunday of spring. So wouldn't you just know that about the time the daffodils pop up and the trees show some blossom and you see an azalea here and there and you get really excited about spring, it snows. <laughs> and then there's some sleet and then there's some hail and then there's some sun. So we're just reminded that Northwest spring can pass as just about any season. I'm going to suggest that we celebrate anyway the many ways that new life begins to speak to us about now. And I'm digressing for a moment because I had an opportunity this morning to briefly see a couple of video clips from the young life, the new life of the teens that are stepping up and marched yesterday on behalf of everyone's lives. If you have seen it, you know what I'm talking about. If you have not seen it, don't miss it. Please find an opportunity to listen to some of the words of those young spokespeople for peace. They will not be silenced. Very exciting. It seems we're always in the process of celebrating something here. I've heard it said that celebration is gratitude in action, and I kind of like that. We offer a practical spirituality here, things people can do. So gratitude through celebration seems to fit us. We are grateful for life. We celebrate life in all seasons, in all its guises. We welcome all people here. You are welcome here. As a group, we come from many backgrounds, different histories, different stories, different lifestyles, many different paths, and we honor our differences and we learn from them because we can. We offer a range of activities at Unity in Linwood, and it is our hope that you will find some of interest. We encourage you to try some new things at your level of comfort and see if your world doesn't expand just a little bit. If it works for you today, please join us for refreshments in the Friendship Hall following today's service. And I have to say, the, the refreshments are provided by our Board of Trustees, and wow, what a spread that was. That was lovely, so <laughs> worth your while. And I want to mention, and Dr. Richard will tell you more, um, the donations today for refreshments will benefit Unity in Linwood's building fund. It will be a good cause. Thank you for your support ahead of time. Today is Prayer Sunday. You are invited to join our prayer chaplains in the family room right at the back of the sanctuary for what we call a divine wholeness session. This is a silent, sacred time of being supported by a prayer chaplain as you open to the movement of spirit within you. At Unity, we teach affirmative prayer. Myrtle Fillmore, one of Unity's co-founders, shared these words, prayer is the most effective method of renewal and transformation because in prayer we associate with the highest outcome for ourselves and for the situation, not with the problem. There is always room for wonder and speculation at Unity and I got to wondering if affirmative prayer could be like a laser light we know that light waves have replaced scalpels in some surgeries because people can focus and concentrate the light beams. They line them all up in a very orderly way and they become very powerful. Perhaps affirmative prayer is similar. In affirmative prayer, we bring focus and alignment to our random scattered thoughts. We make our thoughts consistent with the highest and the best in us, in others, in the situation. When we do this with intention and repetition, our thoughts become powerful and creative. While the description of affirmative prayer is fairly straightforward, doing it is not always easy. So we offer prayer support here through our prayer chaplains. Taking advantage of this support is very easy. Always on Sundays, we are invited to stay after service, come up to the front, and meet with a prayer chaplain individually. And there are other easy ways as well. Filling out a prayer slip that looks like this, that you find in the back of the chair in front of you, is a good way to put a written prayer then into our offering basket. 
And the easiest of all is to just use the confidential prayer line or the online prayer request. And those are found, the number for the prayer line is in your bulletin. And of course, the prayer request is on our link, unityinlinwood.org. Could the prayer chaplains that are with us this service just stand for a moment so we can identify you prayer chaplains wear the purple stoles around their necks. Thank you very much for your service. Affirmations are another way to make spirituality practical. Affirmations are positive statements of highest truth. Each week we share an affirmation together to align ourselves with our highest truth. You'll see today's affirmation up on the screen behind me, and I will read it, and then I will invite you to stand and join me if that works for you. I am life, wisdom, and joy, always moving into greater expression. Please stand. Ready? I am life, wisdom, and joy always moving into greater expression. And while we're on our feet, let's take a minute to say hi to each other.
and I'm coming home. Om Namo Guru Dev Namo Om Guru Dev Namo Om Namo Guru Dev Namo Om Namo Guru
hearts of the heart, breath of life, I bow to you, and I'm coming home, and I'm coming And I'm coming home And I'm coming morning. We host a Holy Thursday service every year. So at 7 o'clock p.m., please join us for what's been written as the most sacred and experiential service of the year. It includes a foot washing ritual, beautiful music, physical communion, a candle lighting service, and a 12 powers meditation. Thursday, 7 o'clock. Today is the last Sunday to register for a spiritual Seder, a fully catered ritual meal hosted by Rabbi Ted Falcon. That will wrap up our 64 Ways and 64 Days season for nonviolence on Wednesday, April 4th, beginning at 6 o'clock p.m. The cost is $40. You may register by finding someone who looks important or by going to the website. <laughs> and finally, if you're interested in becoming a member of this evolving idea we call Unity in Linwood. Please plan to join me on Sunday, April 8th, following this service for an orientation experience, followed by a new member's reception in your honor on Friday the 27th of April, followed by new members Sunday on the 29th. Applications are available at the Welcome and Information Station. If you have not visited our spiritual gift shop lately, today is your day. They are hosting a book sale in Friendship Hall. A number of titles are available at 25% off, and if you haven't noticed, you may now sport about town in your new Unity and Linwood hat and t-shirt combo. Drinking coffee from your Unity and Linwood coffee cup. And it does taste better. I, I... <laughs> so beyond being Palm Sunday. And Kathleen McEwen, yet again a triumph, our in-house designer. Thank you so much. Beyond being Palm Sunday, today is the third in our series entitled The Kingdom of Heaven. And from week one, I've sought to emphasize these as teachings of real world relevance. Judaism's most famous rabbi and Christianity's most revered avatar was, I believe, far more fascinated with how we navigate our earthly journeys together right here on this floating garden than he was with what occurs after these earthly journeys end. I mean, think about it. Last week, we, we chatted about two parables, one in which the kingdom was likened to a woman who bakes, and another in which the kingdom was likened to a man who plants. Everyday people, both. And this week, we turn our attention to a, to a gentleman who who stumbles upon a treasure while skipping through a field, and a merchant who stumbles upon a pearl while searching for a prophet. Everyday people, both. And again, let's be reminded that, that given context, Jesus' stories aren't best taken as 
Sunday school lessons being delivered to third graders. Rather, they are best taken as masterful teaching tales designed to press us beyond ourselves. As provocative and relatable parables meant to bring our easy answers, our arbitrary conclusions, our habitual perceptions, our accepted values into some question. And that, well, tasty things can come from sour stuff in the case of the woman who bakes, and that big things can come from small stuff in the case of the man who plants, as encouraging and as true as these interpretations are, they quite simply don't fit that bill. In other words, such interpretations leave easy answers, arbitrary conclusions, habitual perceptions, and accepted values largely intact. And because normative Christianity likes to strip what it perceives to be any tinge of shadow from such stories and from their author alike. I mean, let's face it, and I won't ask for a show of hands, but there are people in this room who duck and cover at any suggestion that Jesus might have been married. Not to mention at any suggestion that he might have fathered children. And because normative Christianity likes to strip what it perceives to be any tinge of shadow from such stories. We've inherited G-rated titles for these stories, such as, well, the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price, both of which conjure images of Johnny Depp and Orlando Bloom sailing the high seas on something of a pirate ship. And while we don't know if Jesus told these stories consecutively or if they were simply recorded consecutively by skillful editors such as those who compiled Matthew, in the same way that the woman who bakes and the man who plants were recorded together, so too were the trespasser and the treasure and the profiteer and the pearl. I like to call these my Disney corrected titles. <laughs> and so it's been written that the kingdom of heaven is like a person, a merchant, seeking fine pearls. On finding one pearl of extremely great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now for some, the easy answer might assign the merchant as the disciple and the pearl as the teaching. So when the disciple finds the, the gospel, nothing else matters, and the parable becomes one of discipleship. How easy. And for others, the easy answer might assign the merchant as humanity and the pearl as Jesus himself. So when humanity finds Jesus, nothing else matters, and the parable becomes one of conversion. How easy. But if we're to take seriously this image of Jesus with the 12, who were the only audience for these teachings, by the way, if we're to take seriously the image of Jesus with the 12, and in so doing, we, we imagine ourselves seated among them in their context, not in ours. It doesn't really make much sense to assign Jesus, such lines as, well, when the disciple finds the gospel and when humanity finds Jesus, after all, the gospel wasn't written and Jesus wasn't missing. <laughs> I'll let that sink in for a minute. The kingdom of heaven is like a person, a merchant. Now, this, this device of describing a person by a broad category followed by a more specific category was common. The person who sowed weeds among the wheat, for example, was an enemy, a man. 
and the scribe trained for the kingdom of heaven was a man, a householder, and so forth and so on. But unlike the yeast in last week's story, it's pretty tough to find any positive connotations in either the Hebrew or the Christian scriptures for merchant. You'll remember that it was Jesus who's reported to have thrust all the merchants from the temple, saying, stop making my father's house a marketplace. And it was James who's reported to have condemned those who say, we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. So for Jesus to, to start the kingdom of heaven as like a person, a merchant, would raise some eyebrows. It was a great opening line in that way. He was really good at opening lines, you see. In cynical circles of today's world, we, we might imagine a teacher beginning, the kingdom of heaven is like a person, a gambler. Or the kingdom of heaven is like a person, a lawyer. And why are we so hard on our lawyers anyway? I happen to have a number of lawyer friends. I love them all dearly, but I digress. Nonetheless, he's not going so far as to say the kingdom of heaven is like a person, a mafia hitman, or the kingdom of heaven is like a person, a career politician. But he's not saying the kingdom of heaven is, is like a person, a Carmelite nun, or the kingdom of heaven is, a, is like a person, a Boy Scout, either. According to Amy Jill Levine, one appropriate interpretation might be the kingdom of heaven is like a person, a profiteer, who sells unnecessary items at unfair prices. So what we might entertain at this point is that the kingdom of heaven is like a person, a profiteer. Now, according to Pliny, pearls were, were more expensive even than rubies. So rare were these extravagant jewels that the majority of the Roman Empire would not see one in the course of a lifetime. And like the term merchant, the term pearl often imparts something of a negative vibe. It was Timothy who, who wrote, women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold, expensive clothes, pearls. And Revelation offers Babylon that, well, in the interest of any children who might be with us this morning. Let's say that Revelation offers Babylon the horse. <laughs> My ministers are laughing at me. <laughs> Babylon the horse as the great city adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. So with the addition of pearls, to the tail, the eyebrows would still have remained as high as those of a Hollywood heiress in her twilight years, <laughs> leaving us with the kingdom of heaven is, is like a person, a profiteer, seeking items beyond imagination. Now, given his assignment as a merchant, we might conclude that this person sought multiple pearls because he believed they would bring him gain. Had he been assigned as a, as a nobleman, we might conclude that he sought multiple pearls because he believed they would bring him clout. Were he assigned as a woman, we might conclude that she sought multiple pearls because she believed they would bring her note. But he was not assigned as a nobleman. He was not assigned as a woman. He was assigned as a merchant. So we might conclude that he sought multiple pearls because he believed they would bring him gain. And it seems reasonable to presume that, that if this merchant had been satisfied in his seeking, he wouldn't have been the subject of our parable, for he would have already been at the Galilean shore sipping margaritas. 
I threw that in there because the Greek word for pearl is margarita, and I just couldn't pass that up. <laughs> True. So while we don't know how many pearls our merchant found, what we do know is that he relinquished all of them when he found that one special pearl. In fact, he sold everything he owned when he found that one special pearl. And before you insert themes of sacrifice and martyrdom into our tale, as so many before you have done, let's understand that our tale doesn't say that our merchant sold everything he owned at a loss. For all we know, he may have made something of a veritable fortune on his Galilean garage sale. And beyond this, there's no reference to inflation or profitability or to Craig's list. We have no reason to believe that resale was on his mind. So we might conclude that in selling everything he owned, when he found that one special pearl, which of itself was completely incapable of paying the bills, completely incapable of housing his wife, completely incapable of feeding his children. Our merchant had done something that, that to the outer world must have appeared to be nonsensical at best, completely foolhardy at worst. I have to believe that it was in this very moment that our merchant became the butt of countless Jokes which began, there once was a merchant from Galilee. So what we know is that the kingdom of heaven is like a person, a profiteer, seeking items beyond imagination for gain. Unsatisfied with the many, he found one special item so compelling that he relinquished all others to buy it. And because there's no reference to inflation, because there's no reference to profitability, because there's no reference to Craigslist, because we have no reason to believe that resale was on his mind, we conclu conclude that he was, starting with that choice, no longer a merchant. Which leaves us with the kingdom of heaven is like person, a profiteer seeking items beyond imagination for gain, unsatisfied with the many, he found one special item so compelling that he relinquished all others to buy it, and in so doing, he was changed. How are we doing so far? And at this point, let's acknowledge that, that Jesus has done what Jesus was incredibly good at doing. He has provided absolutely no answers, but he has left us with some really provocative questions. For example, is, is the last pearl just another trinket in an exploration of the, of the perils of greed? And after all, was there greed in his world? Yes. Is there greed in our world? Yes. An exploration of the perils of greed would be a really good one for today, if you ask me. Perhaps the great price that was paid was paid by the merchant himself for greed. Or how about this one? Is, is the last pearl the kingdom of heaven? And are we, like our merchant, required to, to detach from all lesser pearls in order to reveal it? Detachment makes for a really good lesson as well, don't you think? Or how about this one? If the, if the pearl is the kingdom of heaven, and since our merchant found it, is this just a a foreshadowing of the kingdom of heaven being at hand, waiting for humanity to reveal it. After all, it seems perfectly clear that the pearl was there all along. That could be a favorite of mine. I like that one. I like that one. Or maybe it's okay for each of us to get something unique. 
And maybe it's even okay for me to get one thing in 2018 and to get something different in 2019. In light of this, and, and whether Jesus intended such an association or not, I will never know, or at least I, I hope not to find out in the next year or two. In light of this, I have to say I really like our merchant. I like him because, because he's relatable. I like him because he reminds me of me. And I suppose this is because I relate to, to standing around the giant pearl plunging barrel, dipping my cosmic spoon into the salty slime for that which I believe will bring me gain. I like to think our merchant because I like to think our merchant, I like our merchant. Boy, I'm going to get this right. <laughs> Breathe, John. We're going to be okay here. I like our merchant because I think he was a human being being human. And perhaps you can relate as well, always seeking that healing, always seeking that circumstance, always seeking that acknowledgement, always seeking that supply, that wisdom, always seeking that which you believe will bring you gain. The Hindu would say that we walk paths of, of pleasure, of success, of community, all of which are appropriate in their respective seasons. But because pleasure and success and community are inadequate to ultimate soul satisfaction, the many paths eventually give way to one path, which his tradition would describe as the eternal realities of life and wisdom and joy. Thank you, Linda Bavin. And I find myself reminded of our tale, a tale in which the many pearls eventually give way to the one pearl, which our tradition would describe as the eternal realities of life, of love and wisdom. Maybe this is what our divine science brothers and sisters meant when they said, you know, in the end, we will all figure out that all we really wanted was God. So for me, in 2018, I hear a tale of awakening. I hear a tale of, of human beings being human for as long as it takes, as we, in the words of this morning's song, simply hold hands and accompany each other home to the eternal realities of life and love and wisdom. And I'm coming home. And I'm coming home. And I'm coming home. 
welcome home. <laughs> now is the time when we provide an opportunity for you to give a financial gift to support the work of this church. We know that prosperity shows up in many ways in our lives, only some of which are things. We are blessed by loving relationships, by jobs of meaning and purpose, opportunities to be of service, and by genuine friendship. From our 64 Ways and 64 Days book on nonviolence, we're reminded that selfless generosity of any kind fosters nonviolence in our world. Thank you for any and all of the ways you are able to give, love, and serve to enhance the strength of this community and lives beyond these walls. Blessed always, blessed always. And for all these gifts that are given today, we give thanks that the spirit of love and truth multiplies all that we are, all that we have, all that we give, and all that we receive. And so it is. Thank you, ushers. I would like to take just a moment now and welcome anyone who might be here for the first time. We don't like to put people on the spot, but we do like to honor newcomers. So if you are brave and you want us to know that you're here for the first time, could you just raise your hand quickly? <laughs> oh, surprise, surprise. This happens to be my family. <laughs> I knew they were here for the first time. And I'm not sure that I need to go through the entire um, education piece about <laughs> Unity and Linwood. If any of you have not filled out a stay in, cut, stay in touch card and you would like to do that at this point in time, you'll find one in the back of the chair in front of you. We would put you on our mailing list and then you'd receive a couple of emails a month and we can let you know what's happening. Of course, we can always know what's happening by visiting the Welcome and Information Station, which we hope you will be making a regular routine of your stop at Unity and Linwood back in the corner. Let me share some of what's coming up. Consider joining our grounds team leader, Cheryl Jones, as we make up our grounds for spring. Wake up, sorry, our grounds for spring and summer planting on Saturday, March 31st at 9 a.m. <laughs> Cheryl's in the house. <laughs> Lunch will be available. Please register and please bring your gloves. April's adult education offering is Unity Prayer. 
on five Tuesdays beginning April 3rd. This class is required for service on any Unity in Linwood prayer team or as a prayer chaplain. Affirmative prayer is at the heart of Unity teachings. The ultimate goal is for each participant to awaken to their divine natures. Participants will be introduced to Unity's five-step prayer process and supported in developing a daily prayer practice. Our health and wellness ministry invites you to two events in April. On Wednesday, April 11th at 7 p.m., join Nancy Joy Callahan for The Body is the Temple of the Soul, an easy desert movement experience to put put to uplifting music, and on Sunday, April 15th at 1, join Anila Goldie, we call her Goldie, in a therapeutic touch workshop entitled Facilitating Well-Being. This holistic therapy incorporates the compassionate use of universal energy to promote well-being. The workshop includes videos, self-balancing meditations, and useful resources. Dr. Garland Landreth from the movie What the Bleep offers workshops on Sunday, April 22nd and April 23rd. Heal the subconscious core issues that hold you back. Create a new brain matrix enabling abundance to flow freely and use the quantum love flow as a way to create miracles. This healing experience combines heart math Oh no, oh, oh no, oh, I did that right every time I practiced it. Ho o pono pono <clears throat> and EFT tapping. Please register at the Welcome and Information Station. It's $49 for both days or $39 for one day, payable at the door. Dr. Landreth also offers private sessions during the day on Monday and Tuesday at an hourly rate. And Dr. Richard has another. I'd like, to give, I'd like to give Linda a little grace over the Ho'oponopono. Oh, thank you. You know, I, I attribute that to to nerves. <laughs> I attribute that to to the pressures of having a birthday. Happy birthday, Linda Baben. We celebrate your Noble Entrance Day as we celebrate the Noble Entrance Day of our Director of Prayer Ministries, Barbara Thorpe, as well. What a good day for humanity. What a good day for humanity. Thank you both for being here. I'd like to extend my thanks on behalf of your Board of Trustees. As you know, when the Board provides hospitality, the donations gathered support the building fund. And starting tomorrow, there will be an installation here in the sanctuary, and it will look something like this. And it will go here. And it will run all the way up, and it will wrap the window. Uh, creating an entirely new focal point, which we believe will not only be gorgeous for you to stand in front of on Sundays. Oh, thank, you. thank you for doing it just for that reason. <laughs> happy, happy birthday. <laughs> but will make us more of a destination for people to celebrate love in the form of getting married every weekend. If you'd like to see this, this will be here. Already this morning we have raised one thousand dollars toward this three thousand dollar project so for your support over the months and for and in thanks for your consideration this morning thank you this place will look different next sunday when you get here the luckiest guy on the world. <laughs> oh. These and all good things happening at Unity in Linwood can be found on your printed program or by visiting our Facebook page or our calendar page of our website at unityinlinwood.org. And because it may, might have been missed, we will be taking uh, funds at, and, and the hospitality um, today to cover the cost of the, the wall. I'm just really going to spell it out for you. If you'll join me, we'll sing our <laughs> peace song.
So if you'd like to invite any soul into this powerful and palpable consciousness of love and support, please speak that first name now. Mm, so let's breathe in a yes. Let's breathe in a yes. On behalf of all of those names spoken, and yet again this week, on behalf of all who have turned something of a spiritual ear to this very conversation, to all who join us from the internet land, we stand with you, we stand for you. And it's with great faith and with great boldness that we lift our voices together then and speak these closing words. The light of God surrounds us. God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. And all is well. The light of God surrounds us. The power of God protects. The presence of God watches over us, and all is well. The love of God enfolds us, wherever we are, God is. We are safe, we are cherished, and all our time as we always do by speaking our words and so it is and so it is and so it is, and so it is.